Hello from the Forestronics YouTube channel. Welcome to how to build a lithium ion and USB power design with built-in charging. And this is part two in what will most likely be a four-part series. Before I get started, if you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up on the video. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and go to forestronics.com for information on our design and manufacturing services for commercial projects. All right, let's get started. So I'm assuming you watched part one and our goal here is to create a design where we can power it with either a five volt input like a USB input or a single cell lithium ion or lithium polymer battery. We can then take those power sources, isolate them, you know, based on if the USB is connected versus the battery, use a voltage regulator to boost the battery voltage up for a nice steady regulated five volt output to power you know, a load such as a microcontroller or LED design or a motor drive circuit, whatever. And of course, it'll also have a built-in battery charging circuit. So here in part two, our focus is gonna be on the voltage regulator design. We're gonna be using a switching boost regulator and I went over the basics of a boost regulator in part one. And I also discussed, you know, some of the challenges and the aspects of dealing with a lithium ion battery. So let's jump into part two. Okay, before we start looking at the boost regulator design and the boost IC that we're gonna use, I thought I'd start by just going through my design process before we dive into the regulator IC and, and how we're gonna uh, configure it for our design. But the first step when I approach a design, a hardware design is, I look at what are my requirements. So what are the requirements that I need this boost regulator to do to satisfy the end design? As we discussed, we're gonna have a USB input that can go up to five volts. We're gonna have a lithium ion cell that we can use to power the design that can go from 4.2 or 4.1 down to 2.5 volts approximately. And I want to get about 500 milliamps and five volts on the output, right? So those are my sort of my input and output specs for the boost regulator. But since this design will be sometimes battery powered, I also care about features related to the battery, right? The boost regulator has to have good efficiency. It has to have, I want it to have features that enable, you know, battery saving elements such as a low voltage cutoff feature. How does it operate in low current situations? So those are some of the stuff I care about. So when I start searching on Mauser or DigiKey for different options for boost regulators, that's the kind of things I wanna keep in mind. So once I do that, I, I'm gonna search for some candidates, some ICs that can fill this need. Once I found an IC that meets these needs, my next step is to read the data sheet. I need to learn about this IC. And I understand that reading data sheets can be tough, especially if you're you're just a hobbyist and this is not your main profession. But that's one important thing to learn if you want to do you know hardware electronic design is we need to learn how to read the data sheet because that's where the information is. That's how we're going to learn how to implement the IC or whatever part we're working with. What's also helpful is if the company provides reference designs, right? So you can look at example designs. What, what components did they use? What are some of the important features of those components? Where do they need to be placed? What are their PCB layout aspects? Then we got to go through component selection, what components are needed, what are their values, what are other aspects of the components? Sometimes when you're working with switching regulators, they'll recommend you know, families of components that they recommend to use because they've already proved that they work with the design. Then step four is build the design schematic and do the PCB layout. When you're doing your first iteration of a design and you're working with a new IC, I typically put in test points so I can make measurements because chances are if it's the first time I'm working with something, I may get something wrong. So I need to be able to make measurements and check the design to figure out if I did something wrong, how can I improve it or how can I correct the mistake in the next iteration. Then from there, I order the PCBs and I build my first two boards. Typically, I want to build two just in case I mess up one. I like to build boards by hand. You could also have them built by the same, often by the same manufacturer that does the PCBs. You can have them do the assembly. And then of course, step six is, you know, you have to test and iterate. I kind of mentioned that already, but uh, iterate the design. Just keep that in mind as we go through this, that this is my approach to, to a hardware design. One step that's, that's possibly missing, but I, I don't typically do it for regulators or, or switching regulators or power designs is simulation. 
If you're working with amplifiers or something like that, a lot of times, you know, I'll use spice simulation tools. There's a lot of free ones out there. But but for boost regulators or regulators, I don't typically use simulation tools. All right, so let's look at the boost regulator we're planning to use for this design. Okay, for this design, I plan to use the TPS61202. This, uh, this data sheet we're looking at is for the whole family of these TPS6120X uh, low input voltage synchronous boost converters. I'm going to use the TPS61202 because that's the one that has a fixed 5 volt output. If you want your design to have a 3.3 volt output or some custom output, you can use other ones in this family for that purpose. And the, the procedure of doing the design is going to be very similar. You're just going to have some different components. I chose this regulator, first of all, because I, I do like Texas Instruments power products, power ICs. I think they make good products, but also it fits a lot of my criteria, right? My in and output criteria, it has 90% efficiency. It's made to work with batteries. So it has features such as programmable under voltage lockout threshold, and I'll discuss what that means. Power save mode for low power operation. So if your design is asleep, it can... It has some features that really improve efficiency when very little current is being consumed. It has the right voltage and current specs that I'm looking for that I mentioned. But if we scroll down, what they do is they kind of provide a typical application design. And so this is not for the exact chip we're gonna use, but it kind of gives you an idea. And if you remember from part one, when we went over the, the, the basics of a boost regulator, Right, here's where our input voltage is, is coming in. Now, in our simple example, we didn't have an input capacitor, but there's gonna be an input capacitor here. Why? Because that input capacitor helps smooth out the input voltage. So if you, if you have a noisy input or a changing input, this will help smooth it out so you have a more stable input. Then, of course, we have our inductor. Now, you might see this VN pin, but this is not actually where the power flows in. This VN is just so the IC can monitor the input voltage. Really, the power is flowing into this L1, this inductor. And if you remember, this sort of serves as a current pump or current source that our switching regulator will charge up or build a magnetic field to supply to this output capacitor to maintain that 5-volt level we're looking we're looking for under our dynamic load conditions. Now you can see we have other pins on here. I'll, I'll go into these other pins in more detail, but one thing I mentioned in part one that wasn't shown in our diagram was the feedback. So we have V out here. We have this resistor divider network, but we won't need this for our design because we have a fixed output. This is if you have an adjustable output, but you can see this feedback pin for monitoring the output voltage. The next thing I wanted to show you is just the simple functional block diagram. And, and once again, this relates back to part one. If you remember our simple design for a boost regulator, one of the most important elements is that MOSFET that, that controls the switching. You know, this acts like a switch closing and opening, which allows us to charge up that inductor and then allow it to supply power to the output capacitor and maintain that fixed voltage level we're looking for. And of course, we're going to monitor V in. You can see that here's where the feedback comes in. So we're monitoring V out via this feedback. And then, of course, we have an oscillator and, and a pulse width modulator that's then used to control that gate of that MOSFET. Once again, to modulate our switching based on the load conditions. You might notice two other MOSFETs up here. This is just, for instance, if, if you do enable not to shut off this chip, these MOSFETs act like switches that open, and that's to conserve battery power so that we don't get any battery power flowing to the output when the chip is not enabled. Okay, for the rest of the video, I'm gonna to go to my schematic for the, uh, for the chip we're gonna implement or the design we're gonna implement in our, in our design. But I just want you to know a lot of the uh, information that I'm gonna show in my schematic comes from this section of the data sheet, application information. This is where it's gonna tell you how to spec your different components, what characteristics you're looking for in the components. They give even an example design right here. And then as you go through here, you can see that they have equations for programming the output voltage, which is not applicable to our design. For the under voltage lockout, which I'll talk about, they have equations there. For selecting the inductor, they have equations here. 
And then they even provide information on recommended inductor families to use. And, and I'm gonna use one of these families in, in the design. So let me switch to my schematic, which is gonna show some of these equations and the component values that we chose. Okay, here we're looking at my Eagle software for PCB layout. So the first step is we create a schematic and then we do the layout and the layout will be covered in a future video. But the way the schematic works is you can kind of see inductors, capacitors, uh, we have ground, ground symbols, and these green wires just represent signal paths for connecting. And anywhere where you see a similar object, so plus five volts, plus five volts, VCC, VCC, this represents connections that are gonna be on the same node. And what I did is I took from the data sheet some of the important equations and notes and put them right here on the schematic. So we'll run through these. And just so you can kind of get your bearing on what we're looking at for this chip, because it's, it's not the same layout that we saw in the data sheet. We have V in here, right? So VCC is basically either the USB five volts or it's the battery power. And we'll, we'll talk about the isolation circuit in part three, but that's what VCC means. The, the plus five volts is the output. So that's the, the regulated five volts we're gonna get from this chip. So we can see our input we have V in and then we have L. So once again, the power doesn't flow into V in. That's just so we can monitor the input voltage. Here's that capacitor, the input capacitor I mentioned to make sure we have a stable input voltage. And then of course the power is gonna flow through the inductor. The regulator is gonna switch on and off like a switch to store energy in the inductor that's pumped in the form of current out to the capacitor, the output capacitor, which is here, C3. Okay, so now we have this IC, how do we configure the surrounding components to deal with the input voltage that, that we're going to have as well as the, the, the output we want? So first I'll start off with the inductor calculation. So they give a very simple calculation for the inductor and they say V in. Well, V in is really just going to be the maximum input voltage. What I did for the, for the maximum input voltage for the inductor calculation is I actually used 5.5, just in case the USB voltage gets above five volts, so I'm trying to be safe. So that yielded an inductor of about 2.75 microhenries. But when I read the data sheet, 2.575 microhenries is not a common inductor value, right? There's, once you get experience using inductors, you'll find that there's common values you can find if you try to get a non-common value that causes the cost of the inductor to go up. So if I read the data sheet, they say this calculation just gives you the minimum inductance, but you can use an inductor higher than that. So that's what I did. I used a common 3.3 microhenry inductor. But the next step for the inductor is to calculate what is the max current in the inductor. Now the max current in the inductor for this application is not necessarily the max output current of the regulator, which is 600 milliamps. You actually get higher currents inside the inductor that are stored as energy or power. So the data sheet, once again, I got this equation from the data sheet, they have this long equation that involves, you know, what is your output voltage? For us, it's five volts. What is your output current? What is V in? Uh, so on and so forth. What is the frequency? What is the inductor you're using? And, and so, the frequency for this chip is 1.5 megahertz. That's its switching frequency. And I got that once again from the data sheet. The inductor value, we know what that is because we just calculated it. The max input voltage, so this comes a little bit from experience, is I didn't want to use the five volts from the USB input. The reason is, is because that would make this equation actually come out with a smaller current. So I chose a voltage that maximizes this current value. So I chose 4.2 from the battery. And then of course, uh, the output current is six milliamps. So if I plug all those values in, I get a current of about 974 milliamps, which I just rounded up to one amp, which is a common rating for inductors. So now we have our inductor characteristics. We have 3.3 microhenries with a maximum of one amp of current and I went to the one of the family inductor families that the data sheet recommended, and so I'm using this model number inductor. And of course, I'll share my bomb at the end of the, uh, the video series with all the part numbers. The next thing we want to do is we want to calculate the output capacitance. And, and for the input capacitance, I just use what they recommended. They recommended 
at least a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. I always, when I'm working with regulators, typically go higher in capacitance because it leads to less noise and better state voltage stability. So I chose a, a 10 microfarad one here. But going back to the output capacitance, I use the formula they gave, so five times the inductance. So we know what our inductor is, that's why I went through that first, and we get 16.5 microfarads. Once again, 16.5 microfarads is not a common capacitor value. So I chose 22 microfarads, because that goes with my rule, always go with higher capacitance, don't go with the minimum one. And once again, that leads to better output stability and typically less low frequency noise on your DC output. So I'm choosing 22 microfarads and I plug that in here. Now one thing the data sheet recommends, and I always do this when I'm working with voltage regulators, whether they're uh, linear or switching, is they recommend ceramic capacitors that have dielectric materials that are either X5R or X7R. Now, I don't know what the composition of materials are for X5R or X7R, but what I do know from experience is these dielectrics have low ESR. So ESR stands for equivalent series resistance, and it's a spec that, that basically relates to the fact that capacitors are not ideal components. They actually have some resistance in there. And for these power applications, you want very little series resistance because it slows down the rate the capacitor can charge and discharge. So TI is telling me, we'd like you to use these type of capacitors. So all my capacitors in this circuit are gonna have one of these two dielectrics. Finally, I'll mention the under voltage lockout. So this is a equation to set that. And what this is, is it shuts the converter off. It basically opens that output when this under voltage is reached. And so for batteries, this is important because we don't want to discharge the battery too far. So what I have this set for is approximately 2.5 volts. So this, if my battery gets to 2.5 volts or lower, this converter will shut off to avoid draining the battery too low. And so I use this equation to get my resistor values. So I'm using a 2.26 mega ohm resistor and a 249 kilo ohm resistor. And the idea here is we wanna choose resistors values as high as possible because the battery voltage is tied to VCC. So after this chip shuts off with a low battery voltage, we want very little current flowing through this divider network to ground. And so TI provides guidance, once again, in the data sheet, they say, we need a minimum current to reach this pin so make sure you don't choose resistors too high. So for instance, I couldn't put like a 10 mega ohm resistor here, but I, but I put as high a value resistor I can to get the voltage I want there. I hope that makes sense. Uh, this enable pin, this enable pin, I'm not using it. So I, I just tie it to VCC. So whenever there's a power applied, th this chip is enabled. You can use the enable pin though for shutting the, the chip off if you don't want current to flow out of it. I don't need to use it because my isolation circuit has a function that'll handle that. So I just always have it enabled. This V aux, this is basically, once again, I got this from the data sheet I, and this capacitor value. This is basically in, in a pin that's tied to where the voltage control and voltage comparisons are happening, I think. And so the idea is they just wanted a capacitor here that shunts high frequency noise to ground is my understanding of that pin. So once again, I just configured it how the data sheet told me. These EP123, these are a pad on the bottom of the chip and that pad is basically ground, but we wanna make sure we tie that pad to, to the copper ground plane of our PCB so it can dissipate heat and not only, not only allow ground current to flow, but dissipate heat. But we'll talk about that more in the, uh, in the PCB layout phase. Also, we have two different grounds we have power ground and regular ground, and this is a way to isolate noise caused by this chip from the rest of our circuits. I'll cover that more in the PCB layout. But that's an overview of the design for our regulator and how I came up with those components. And of course, I'll share the, the part numbers for the components. Now, of course, where we put these, part num these components on the PCB also matters, but we'll cover that in part four. Okay, that's it for part two. In part three, we're gonna go over the power isolation slash switching circuits for our power sources, as well as the lithium ion cell charging circuits.
If you have any questions, please use the comment section. If there's anything I missed, please use the comment section as well. Thank you for watching and I'll see you back here for part three.